It's great to be here. I feel a bit of a fraud after all the other great speakers, especially Malcolm, um, who's one of my heroes. And um, But it's great to be here, and it's great that this symposium has been organised and put in place, and in the North Coast area as well, which had a big, important part of Lewis's early childhood life. Um, <clears throat> my presentation will be um, probably a bit more personal than some of the others, um, and this is about the sculpture. It was put in place, I think, 24 years ago, but started 25 years ago. Um, and um, which actually started in our kitchen table in Port Stewart, um, which is not very far from here. I'd just been married a year, and my wife was very patient with me, um, and I started to make the sculpture in our kitchen in Port Stewart. Um, her patience ran out after a while, and <laughs> I had to move the sculpture outside to a lean-to. We had a gardener called, um, I don't remember his name now, but um, he looked like Fred Flintstone. And he would come in um, to take the lawnmower out of this like side building at the at the at the at the side of the house, and we had a toilet that backed onto this building, and the window was open one day, and I happened to be walking past, and I I could hear him coming in to get the lawnmower, and I had the figure ready made, and it was in this space, and he started talking to the figure, um, which I found alarming, but also a compliment in terms of it, you know, the, the realism. Um, so. Um, that, that, was a, that was a big thing. I think his name was George. Yeah, George. Um, so for me, Lewis really impacted my life as a, as a young person. And in my faith journey, Lewis played a big uh, part in helping me to identify with creativity, um, which I found a very low, lonesome place to be um, within a church system, ironically. And the place where creativity should be um, at its maximum um, is sometimes viewed with a certain amount of suspicion and, and distance. In the letter to the Ephesians, between verse 1 and 18, the Apostle Paul writes this, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. C.S. Lewis had seeing eyes. He had eyes that saw from the heart. And he had a sense of wonder even as a child. He never lost that. He said in surprise by joy, that he was the product of good parents, good food, and a garden. Walter Hooper writes this <clears throat> um, about Lewis. Lewis struck me as the most thoroughly converted man I'd ever met. Christianity for him was, was never a separate department of life. His whole vision of life was such that the natural and the supernatural seemed inseparably combined. So Lewis lived a Christ-shaped life. And for Lewis, theology had a cosmic significance. Theology was not something just known. It was a lived thing for him. A three-dimensional lived thing. Not just ideas about theology, but it was embodied into his experience, his narrative of the everyday. And this was a necessity for Lewis. Theology is not just knowledge about God. It is knowing God and it is not just sentences or ideas. Lewis didn't just quote the verse, he lived the verse. We are called to live the verse. Theology is not knowledge about knowledge. It is a lived thing. A quotation I put on the back of the sculpture, which we'll look at shortly, reads like this. C.S. Lewis did not just hang clothes in a wardrobe. He hung ideas. Great ideas of sacrifice, redemption, victory, and freedom for the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve. Set within the commonplace, revelation within something ordinary <clears throat> that looks ordinary on the outside, revelation through investigation. We should not stop looking. Some of the greatest things can be found in the most ordinary of places, like a wardrobe. This is a great quotation by Lewis. God doesn't want something from us. He simply wants us. And this idea of giving yourself over was so important to him. And it was through reading a letter that Lewis wrote in 1961 um, to a girl called Anne Waller that inspired the Genesis, the starting point for this sculpture. This is a map um, between the kilns in Oxford and Whipsnade Zoo. And at 11.15, on Monday the 28th of September 1931, 
Lewis made this journey with his brother, Warney. Lewis was in a side car of the motorcycle and Warney was driving. It's approximately 40 miles between the two points. Lewis, when he got into the sidecar that morning, was a theist. When he arrived at Whipsnade Zoo, he was a Christian, a believer. What happened between those two points? Whipsnade Zoo had just opened that <coughs> um, earlier that year, and Morney and Jack and some other friends who followed behind the car were very keen to go and see um, the zoo and the animals that it contained. One creature in particular stuck out to Warney and Jack, a little bird called Mr. Bultitude. They nicknamed him Mr. Bultitude. That's an actual photograph of him in the, the lower left. And he would salute for buns. And that, <laughs> Jack and Warney liked that. In fact, they went back the following week to see um, Mr. Bultitude again. So this um, journey that Lewis went on in terms of his faith, his new beginning, um, was part of this idea of grace exchange, which he embodied in his life and his living, and part of an idea that he pushed into other people's lives um, through his writings, through his thinking, through his communication, and through his letters. He received many letters from children monthly, and he replied to all of them. This is Anne Waller. Um, she's about <clears throat> 10 or 11 years old in this, in pho in this photograph. And she wrote to C.S. Lewis in 1961, very curious about why Aslan had to give himself up. And Lewis wrote back to her. And that letter was the thing that inspired me. I saw it with a friend, Keith. We were down staying with Douglas Gresham, C.S. Lewis's stepson. And I was shown the letter. When I read the letter, um, the hair stood up in the back of my neck. It was a profound moment for me. And Lewis talks about this idea of being a translator, of making um, complicated things in one sense simple so that we can understand. And certainly that's what he did in this letter to Anne. Um, this is the envelope of the letter. Um, it's got a Cambridge stamp mark on it. It's towards the end of Lewis's life and he was based in Cambridge. And this is the content of the letter. A very important letter. It's half A4 size, both sides. And it's considered to be the most pivotal letter that describes the whole Chronicles of Narnia basically in a paragraph. And this is the letter that he wrote to Anne. Um, I contacted Anne um, after I saw this letter and spoke to her. It took me a while to track her down. She was older, obviously. This was 1961 when she received the letter. And this was around 1997. And I said, what was it like to receive a letter from C.S. Lewis? And she'd written to him because she was concerned about Aslan giving himself up, which the letter deals with. And she said, I'll never forget the morning my mum came to my bedroom door and said, who do you know in Cambridge? And handed me the letter. It was a Saturday morning. She was off school. She read the letter and she said, I carried that letter in my pocket for two years. Mr. Lewis helped me find my faith. And this is what Lewis says. Dear Anne, what Aslan meant when he said he had died is in one sense plain enough. Read the earlier book in the series called The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe and you will find the full story of how he was killed by the White Witch and came to life again. When you've read it or read that, I think you will probably see that there's a deeper meaning behind it. The whole Narnian story is about Christ. That is to say, I ask myself, supposing... There really was a word, a word like Narnia. And supposing it had like our world gone wrong. And supposing Christ wanted to go into that world and save it as he did ours. What might have happened? The stories are my answer. Since Narnia is a world of talking beasts, I thought he would become a talking beast there as he became a man here. I pictured him becoming a lamb because A, the lamb is supposed to be the king of the beasts. B, Christ is called the land of Judah in the Bible. And see, I'd been having strange dreams about lions when I began writing the books. Then he lays out the listings of the books. The magician's nephew tells, uh, tells the creation how evil entered Narnia, the land, the witch, and the word of etc., the crucifixion and resurrection, Prince Caspian, re restoration of the true religion after a corruption, the horse and the boy, his boy, the calling of a conversion of a heathen, the voyage of the drawn treader, the spiritual life, especially in Reap Cheap, 
silverchair, the continued war against the powers of darkness, the la last battle, the coming of the Antichrist, the ape, the end of the world, and the last judgment. All clear. Yours, C.S. Lewis. <laughs> um, I mean, that's basically it, you know, and um, that impacted that young girl's life. Um, she said she carried that letter in her pocket for two years. Mr. Lewis helped me find my faith. Um, there's the letter and the envelope together. There is some debate about the envelope being written by Warney, but I've looked into this very closely recently, and, and it's the same hand on the envelope as it is in, in, the, in the handwriting. And this is Anne as a, in later life, and this is on the day the sculpture was unveiled, and Anne came with the actual letter to the sculpture unveiling. That letter's now in the, uh, the special collections at Queen's University in the C.S. Lewis archive. Um, I went a few weeks ago with um, the brilliant students from John Brown University to see it. We got a special um, um, reception from the university and access to actually view the, the letter in a, in, a, in a sort of private room, which was a pretty profound experience. This is the sculpture, um, or how it ended up. I mean, I did actually start that on the, on the kitchen table um, in Port Stewart. And there was no funding for this sculpture. This was not a commission. It was an idea. My friend Keith had an idea about writing a musical about Jack. There was nothing being done in Belfast to celebrate the centenary of Lewis's birth, apart from some lectures and a blue plaque that was unveiled at Dundella Villas, uh, uh, sorry, Dundella Flats on the site of Dundella Villas where Lewis was born. And we thought we, we should try and do something. And I'd only done one sculpture before, which was commissioned by Bass. And although I didn't drink their product, I found the experience of working with Bass very sobering. <laughs> um, there might be some other jokes in this talk, and if you want to wait to the end and then all laugh together, um, you can do that. Um, so I had one experience with the sculpture before, and I knew there was a lot of technical um, uh, detail involved in the process of casting. There were no foundries in the north of Ireland to do it. It had to be done in Dublin. And this was an expensive thing to do at the time. <clears throat> I naively thought that the site could be done for about £3,000, but it ended up costing £44,000. And the sculpture at that time was around £60,000, £70,000. And I had £5.50 from my, <laughs> it's true, from my niece's piggy, piggy bank. She gave me the first donation. And she's now in her... Um, about 30 years old. And she had faith in this project as a little kid. And she connected with Lewis as a child, as Lewis would connect with children. And we had to raise and find the funding um, for the sculpture um, to put it in place. <clears throat> Looking back on it, if I was to try and do it now, I'd have so many doubts. But then something, there was just something in the air that happened that made it work, that made it happen. This is a sculpture arriving from Dublin. Uh, being brought out of the transport lorry. And um, you can see it's on a, on a little, well, like a big metal rack that had to be fastened to a foundation. All the technical aspects of putting a sculpture in place, you know, there's lots of things. There's planning permission, there's foundations that have to be put in, there's all kinds of coordinations that have to take place. This is uh, one of the stonemasons. And you can see this substructure that's bolted into the ground. Then the uh, ground level is built up over that. And then it's very neatly paved which was an amazing job by this um, guy. He was from the Mourns. When I was putting the sculpture in place, um, I was curious about what people's reaction would be. Um, the first reaction I got on that day was a man who walked up to me and said, why are you putting up a sculpture to Lewis Carl in East Belfast? <laughs> and I said, it's not Lewis Carl, it's C.S. Lewis. What has Lewis Carl got to do with East Belfast? And I thought, just let it go. That's it. <laughs> and he walked off, and I thought, that's scary. The second interaction was a lady coming with two shopping bags full of shopping, and she says, they'll burn that wardrobe in a week, son. <laughs> <laughs> that wardrobe will be burnt in a week. I said, it's not wood, it's bronze. It'll be burnt in a week, I'm telling you. Um, and she walked off. And then I thought, this is not, <laughs> this is not going well. Um, it's taken quite a while to get here, and the first two interactions are really negative and not encouraging. Some people do have the blessed gift of discouragement and don't have to work too hard at it. They can do it sometimes by a look, or they can embody it with conversation like those two people did. But then something amazing happened, which really impacted me. I felt this tugging at my coat. 
It was a wet November day, and I turned around, and there were three little girls standing. Mister, is this about C.S. Lewis? I said, yeah. We love him. We're reading his book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. What's the chair for? I said, well, the chair is for children to sit on and be transported through the imagination of Lewis and into Narnia. Can we be the first ones to sit in the chair? I said, yeah. So they were about maybe 10. So they'd be, um, I'm not very good at maths, 25 years ago. They'd be um, about 35 now. And I would love to try and find them. You know, what, what are they doing now? What happened to these kids? But they were reading the land in which they were at the time. And they got it. It connected with them. They didn't have the mental obstruction baggage that the adults had. They saw it very clearly. And when I interacted with those children, those three young girls, I knew the sculpture was going to work. And it's, it's, it's contacted through Lewis's writing so many people since then. And that was a big moment for me um, before the unveiling. <clears throat> this is the, C the C.S. Lewis sculpture now. Um, about 18, 18 years later, Belfast City Council caught on to the idea of the importance of C.S. Lewis and spent about three million pounds on a like a, like a square behind the sculpture with lots of other sculptures. Um, they wanted to remove that sculpture from where it was and put it in with the other sculptures. And I really put my feet down and said, look, it can't be moved. It's outside a library. The whole idea is to encourage children to interact with <clears throat> reading, literature, and creativity. And you pass through this area to go into the square. So it's like you're going through the wardrobe into Narnia. And I think then they got, they got the message. But it took them about 18 years to catch on to the importance of Lewis in East Belfast, which is sort of kind of frightening. Um, these are some details of the sculpture. <clears throat> um, and you can't really see it there, but we'll, we'll come to it. On the back of the sculpture is um, the letter by it that Lewis wrote to Anne, and it's in bronze. And when Anne came with the actual letter to the unveiling, um, and I knew she was going to bring it, I was so touched, I got another one of these cast in bronze and presented it to her as a gift. And she couldn't believe that I'd done that. She was so touched. But because of that grace exchange that Lewis showed in that letter, it might have taken him about maybe 10 minutes to write that letter. It impacted her life, and it impacted my life. And it impacted those three little kids on that first day when the sculpture was being put in place. And it's impacted so many other lives since then. It's not me putting words into Lewis's mouth. It's him still saying it. The day he sat down and wrote that letter, that grace exchange, the grace that he experienced in his life in the sidecar of that motorcycle, when it came to the point where he knew that Christ was the Son of God, that Christ was the Savior of the world, that Christ was changing his life. And as Lewis said, the great angler had his hook in my mouth for years and was bringing me in. So the idea of grace exchange is something that we need to consider in our lives, in whatever area of life we're involved in, the idea of giving out the grace that we've been given in is so important. These are the people who helped finance the sculpture. <clears throat> this is a photograph of my daughter, Grace, she's now 21, and this is the first day she came to see the sculpture. She was very disappointed that she couldn't get into Narnia. Um, I had to make sure the wardrobe was weld welded up on the inside because there were a group of drunks who used to sit near the library and drink wine and other beverages through the day. And I was concerned about the drunks trying to get into Narnia. And if one had got inside the wardrobe, um, would he be able to get out again? Um, so... <laughs> Grace is very disappointed that she couldn't get access. But here's a list of the people who helped um, make the sculpture. And um, there's a few people that I just want to pick out here. Um, the dove at the top represents someone who I still don't know who it is, who in 1997 donated uh, money to start the sculpture fund off. I went to Belfast City Council, and they were going to offer me 80% funding for the sculpture from, the lot from lottery funding. And because this is about C.S. Lewis and because of other theological connotations that I would hold to, um, I refused the lottery funding. And the guy who, whose office I was in said, are you serious? You're refusing? How much money have you got in place? I said, I've got £5.50. <laughs> um, 
Who, where'd you get that? I said, my, 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 my niece gave me it uh, from her piggy bank. Right, you've got five pounds fifty and you're rejecting 80% funding of 80,000 pounds. I said, yeah. He said, get out, leave my office. I said, there must be some other fund I can tap into um, that is not from lottery funding because Lewis would start to spin very fast in the graveyard at um, Headington Church. If he knew I was going to accept that, he would have an issue about it morally and for other reasons. He said, there is some other funding, but you need to have funding in place first, and it needs to be more than £5.50. Um, <clears throat> so I left um, the council offices in Lynn Hall Street, dejected, walking away, thinking this is never going to happen. And then two weeks later, I got a phone call from someone who said that a business person in East Belfast wanted to donate £6,500 anonymously to help start the sculpture fund off. I went back to see the arts officer and told him, I've got six thousand five hundred pounds and five pounds fifty. <clears throat> he said, where did you get six and a half thousand pounds inside ten days? I said, to be truthful, I don't know. Um, it was donated anonymously. And he said to me, why would someone want to donate six and a half thousand pounds anonymously? And I said, because they didn't want to be known. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just... Yeah. Okay, he said, when you come back with a bank statement with two trustees, a Belfast City Councillor, a business person, and you show that that money's been put into the bank, then you can get some funding from the council. So we did get some, some funding from the council. <clears throat> um, we got some funding from a local company, um, Landis Frozen Foods, which I always like to promote um, times like this. Um, and also NIE, you can see it's on there, Northern Ireland Electricity. I think I may have the bill with me. Yeah. Um, Sorry, um, yeah, NIE. Um, for 24 years, I've not been paying my bill on time because NIE gave 95 pounds. That was their donation. A multi-million pound company um, gives 95 pounds, not 100 pounds or 98 pounds, but 95 pounds. So <clears throat> I wait for these court letters and then I pay. <laughs> The other people I'd like to mention on this group um, of names, um, there was one complainer actually, Parkgate Garages, and they were a car showroom in East Belfast. They thought they were gonna get their name across the back of the wardrobe, Parkgate Garages, not present finance on that 1.4 um, Fiesta, Ford Fiesta. Um, but as you see, it's just on a list on the back of the wardrobe. And the other standout name for me is um, Panjana Limited. It should be down there somewhere. Um, and they are tea blenders in East Belfast. And I always like to promote uh, Punjana. And I'd like to sort of offer some of the And if anybody else would like to try, just come up to me afterwards and there's, there's plenty left. So Punjana um, Tea Company uh, gave 2,000 pounds. And that was amazing. So all these people on this list helped to make this sculpture happen. So in a way, they were showing a form of grace exchange. They were believing in what this idea was about. It took some time, a lot of persuading, but they got the picture. So this is a very famous quotation by Lewis, which is on the back of the wardrobe. This is precisely what Christianity is about. This world is a great sculptor's shop. We are the statues, and there is a rumor going round the shop that some of us are someday going to come to life. The sculpture's still there, and Lewis is still speaking, and the grace exchange is still working through that letter. I'm not putting words into his mouth, and he is still putting that idea forward, this concept of redemption, this concept of a new beginning, this concept of a giving love and a grace that changed his life. <clears throat> These are some projects I've worked with kids in schools over the years, um, uh, projects on C.S. Lewis, and children really interact. They, they, they love Lewis's work. And he never lost that child, almost like childlike imagination. It was still part of his um, identity, part of his being until he, in, in the very last years of his life as well. And that's why people connect with Lewis. Um, I remember years ago um, on a visit to Harvard University, um, I was sitting in the Great Hall one morning for breakfast 
And this student came over. Um, um, she was actually from England. I think this was her third PhD. And she sat down and she, uh, talking to me and what do you do? And I said, I'm a sculptor. I'm working on on a project at the minute about C.S. Lewis and um, and it's sparked by a letter that's connected to the line, The Wish in the Wardrobe. And this young woman, really intelligent, said, oh, I, I, I've read that book when I was a child. I, that lion is amazing. I can't get his his name, his, his the idea of what he did in Narnia, how he brought spring back and how he brought redemption to the place. I can't get it out of my head. And I sat and explained to her what the whole concept was about. And she didn't know. But at that moment, almost like a little bomb of grace went off in her mind. And I could see her eyes lighting up and recognizing what this was about. It was a profound moment. And as it's recorded in um, the Chronicles of Narnia, you would not have called to me unless I'd been calling to you, said the Lamb. And Christ still calls out to us. Um, in this day, in this age of confusion, of fragmented self, that call still goes out. <clears throat> and the grace exchange of C.S. Lewis still works in the lives and hearts of people because of his faithfulness to what he was called to. Thank you very much. Hello. Yes, thank you very much, Ross. That was wonderful. Um, we'll be able to take a few questions now, I think, as well. Yeah. So I'll move so somewhere I can see. And um, well, maybe perhaps I'll actually kick things off, Ross, if that would be okay. Something that really struck me about what you said um, <clears throat> at the start, actually, that wonderful quote about Lewis being the product of good parents, good food, and a garden. And it really struck me because one of our main <coughs> themes today, obviously, is the relationship of art to the nat natural world. Um, and it just it really it really made me wonder um, what your thoughts were on that on your relationship to, to nature I suppose as an artist yourself. Yeah, I mean I, I mean I think all children um, as they're growing up you know have this connection to creativity through nature. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, our education system educates children out of that and takes them away from it. Um, creativity is not valued highly in our in our system, and um, unless you have an inspirational teacher. Thankfully, I had one at school who changed my life, my art teacher. Um, it's going to be very hard to get through that um, because there's a lot of, um, I don't know, almost like it's seen as not worthy to be involved in creativity. And yet, if you were not, if all the artists, the writers, the poets, the musicians, the playwrights, you know, had not done what they, they, they did and they're still doing, we'd be living in a very, very boring world. Absolutely, yeah. And um, we need to be respectful of that. And we need to encourage children if we have opportunity to interact with, act, act with them at school, in, in our families, in our neighborhoods, um, to encourage their creativity. And just to encourage them, you know, encouragement is oxygen to the soul. Yeah. And as I said earlier, there are so many people who have the, the blessed gift of discouragement. Um, so we need to be careful how we approach, especially young people. But we all need encouragement. And, and as adults, we need to be encouraged as well. So, I mean, for me, the natural world has always supplied a, a sense of wonder. I still, you know, look out in the morning and, and, you know, have this sense of wonder about being alive, about being able to breathe, mm -hmm. about one more day, about one more day of life and about all I'm going to see within that day. Um, I find that, you know, nourishing. That's brilliant. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, and I think it's great as well. Something that strikes me about even your sculpture, the fact that it is... This might seem simple, but the fact that it is situated outside and it's not something that you go to a museum to see or, you know, you have to enjoy it outside and you can really appreciate that natural element of, of art and appreciating art. So, um, no, that's brilliant. Thank you. Does anybody have any other questions? Yeah. I'll get this up to you. Yeah, I would just like to ask about, did you plan for the oxidization of the bronze? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, can you say that again, please? Did you plan the oxidation of the bronze? Um, yeah, the, the, the patina, you mean? The greening of Oh, the green. No, I didn't plan that, but dogs had a bit of play in that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Bronze naturally oxidizes on time mercury. You know, all that. Did you have to do any planning beforehand about how that would affect the sculpture? Like, would it cause weak points or <coughs> damage the effect of it? Um, it wouldn't cause weak points, but you know it had to be patinated. So when you're patinating a sculpture, um, you heat it with a flame gun because bronze, when it's heated, almost like the pores in the metal open up. Then you put the, pati um, the patina color on, which you spray on. And as the bronze cools down, it contracts and traps that color in the surface. So you can make a bronze sculpture white, you can make it blue, you can make it green, you can make it brown, um, as, as the sculpture was there. So that um, patina that you put on is a protective thing. Then you put layers of wax on top of that. It's a bit like polishing a pair of shoes. Um, it keeps the weather off. So a bronze sculpture needs to be re-waxed every, I don't know, maybe four or five years. Has there been any vandalism to the sculpture? Well, thankfully it wasn't burnt in a week. <laughs> um, you know, it's been there like over 24 years. Um, I can safely say w within those years, and because there was a lot of people who were saying, like, you shouldn't put it there. Um, there was all these ideas where it should go. Some lady wanted it to go in the roundabout outside Campbell College, but she didn't donate. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> yeah, well, it wasn't going anywhere near there. <clears throat> anyway, but it might have caused a few accidents on the roundabout. Um, but that area, Lewis would have walked, his grandfather lived two streets away. And um, he would have walked past there when there was railway arches. It's called, the area is called the arches. He would have known that area. Um, and because the library was there as well, and the library just being newly built, I thought this was the ideal place. And um, there was a lot of people who were negative about it going there. It'll be destroyed, it'll be graffiti, it'll be... But over the years, I think there's been one or two little minor things that, you know, basically nothing, you know, which in, in one sense surprised me because um, people put things into your head sometimes. It's going to be damaged, going to be vandalized, but no. Um, and people actually in the area love it. You know, they, you know, they respect it and kids especially. Um, and... You know, I've had a few amazing experiences, you know, when I went to the sculpture with kids who happened to be there. Um, so it hasn't been really touched or vandalized. Hey, um, that was really interesting. I'm just wondering if C.S. Lewis has influenced you in your other work as well as this piece, or <coughs> was that particular to this, or has it been an ongoing influence? Um, yeah, an ongoing influence, yeah. Um, Lewis's influence in my life um, as a, an individual, as a person, is, is pretty profound. I've become a bit of an anorak about Lewis um, in terms, like, you know, for the last month or so, I've been doing a portrait of C.S. Lewis every day. I, don't, I didn't really want to put that out there, but um, it's like a therapy thing. Um, I've been doing a series of little heads when he was, like, nine years old. And um, it's that idea of how... At nine years old, he lost his mother, the big absolute in his life. And yet, you know, Warney's like little garden in the top of a tin lid inspired him so much. And how he got past that and the idea of all that, well, that was going to come out in later years, being in that young heart and mind, you know, I just think that's amazing. That's why we have to be careful how we encourage children and that we don't put them off. And there were people who encouraged him at that age. And that was a devastating thing to happen. And, and, and the sculpture is actually a parallel between Lewis and Diggory Kirk. Diggory Kirk was his alter ego in The Magician's Nephew. Lewis's, um, or in The Magician's Nephew, Diggory Kirk's mother had cancer. Diggory Kirk was nine years old. In real life, um, Lewis's mother, Flora, had cancer. She was 46 years old when she died. And he was only nine. And the week that she died, she called the boys in, the two boys, and gave them a Bible each. Um, I saw one of the Bibles in Wheaton College in the Wade Collection, in very shaky handwriting she had written from Mummy. And um, so she had a big uh, impact on his life and encouraged him. And that encouragement went beyond her death. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I think we have to be careful how we, how we deal with people, um, especially the young, and um, that we need to encourage others. It's so important. I found that. Um, I like to be encouraged. Um, I'm encouraged by being here today. And um, I think we have to, like the Grace Exchange concept, encourage others as well. That's wonderful, yeah. Um, let me see, anyone else that would like to ask a I'm scanning around. Oh, do you want to pass this along? 
How do you start a sculpture in your kitchen? Like, <laughs> how do you start like a wardrobe and like a person just in your kitchen? Um, I think my wife's here somewhere. It might be good maybe you speak to her afterwards. Um, well, I just, I hadn't even been married a year when I started the sculpture in my kitchen. And I think that might have something to do with it. Um, I wouldn't be able to do that now. I wouldn't, that, would, <laughs> that wouldn't be happening. Um, but, my wife was very gentle and gracious to me in terms of letting me do that. I mean, it was a bit of a mad idea to start a sculpture in the kitchen. Um, I didn't really have a studio space at that time um, nearby. It, it then moved out um, to where George kept the lawnmowers. And um, then it went, uh, and then I worked on it in Dublin in, in the foundry. So <clears throat> it started off as a little model, a small model, which I took around a lot of those sponsors whose names were on the list. And some people couldn't make the visual gap or leap, you know, from an idea. But when they saw a model, they could get get it. And in the model, he wasn't holding a chair. He was holding a book because I couldn't afford a chair. Um, it was going to be like something like 8,000 quid to cast a chair or, or make a chair and cast it in bronze. But someone sponsored the chair. Um, and that's why the chair's there. Um, it originally was a book because um, it was just more economical. Um, so it started off as a model and it started off as a figure. And then I started to build wax up and, and mold it. And um, we had a next door neighbor at that time called Flory. And she used to, Flory, would, every day she would make the dinner at a certain time. And I was outside working on the figure and I could see her looking out. And she came down with another elderly neighbor and said, look, can we have a photograph taken with the, with the, with this, with the figure? I said, yeah, um, <laughs> if you want to. Um, and they were the first ones sort of like basically to see the figure emerge. Um, and then I took it to Dublin and worked on it in the foundry. How does the letter still affect you now? How does the letter still affect me? <clears throat> because of its clarity, because it's so clear. And in that paragraph, Lewis lays it out really simply. He wasn't talking down to a 10-year-old um, child. He was talking to a 10-year-old person. And um, I just admire that so, so much. You know, I've been in his house in Oxford, I've seen the desk, you know, um, and you know where he'd written letters to lots of other children, and um, you know, it's just the clarity of the letter is so direct, and it's all basically in a paragraph. I mean, people have written books from all parts of the world about the meaning of the Chronicles of Narnia, you know, like all kinds of people, PhDs, all kinds of people, and here it is in one letter, one basic paragraph. That's how it affects me. And that idea of being clear about things and having clarity is so important.